This is the sixth video supplement for CIS 343, Grand Valley State University's course on programming languages. This video discusses LISP. As they are to any dialect of LISP, LISPs are fundamental to Kava and Scheme. As you've seen already, every expression in Scheme is a list. The first element of a list is the function to run, and the remaining elements are the parameters. In this video, we're going to look more carefully at using lists as pure data. So in the most general sense, a list is just a sequence of values inside parentheses. For example, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Fred, Wilma, Barney, A, B, C, D, E. And in fact, the values don't even have to be the same type. Right? 1, Fred, E is also a valid list. It's also worth noting that the function calls on the right are also lists of mixed type. The first item on the list is a function, whereas the remaining items on the list are of whatever type the parameters are. Now back on the left, be sure to notice the single quotes in front of the lists. We need that single quote to distinguish between lists on the right that are functions that should be executed and the lists on the left that are just data. Now we saw this in an earlier video, but as a refresher, watch this. If I just put in a raw data list, one, two, three, four, five, I get an error. I get an error because the first element in the list, one, is an integer, not a function. But without that single quote to indicate this is a data list, Kava is trying to execute a function named one. And of course, if I go back and add that single quote, the interpreter is happy. Now, in the context of a list, the single quote is just a shortcut for calling the list function. All right, this is very analogous to the single quote in front of a symbol being a shortcut for the quote operator. Now, speaking of symbols, notice that when I create a list of symbols, I only need the single quote in front of the list. I don't have to put that single quote in front of each individual symbol. And that's because that single quote, in some sense, applies to the entire list. Now, this behavior of quoting the entire list is an important difference between the single quote and calling the list function itself. If we build a list using the list operator, Kava is going to recursively execute any expressions inside that list. So, for example, if I build a list this way with 1, 2, 3, plus 4, 5, 6, 7, Notice that it executed that expression 4 plus 5 and inserted 9 into the list. On the other hand, if I were to put a single quote in there, then everything inside that list is taken literally, so I get the literal plus 4 or 5 in the resulting list. Now, in this case, I wanted it to add 4 and 5, so I used the list operator. But let's take this example where I want to create a nested list. The single quote gives me what I want. I want literally the sublist f and g to be the fourth element of that top level list. In contrast, if I try to build a list of symbols using the list operator, I get an error like you see because it's not treating those elements after the word list as symbols, but as names that it expects to be bound to functions or values. I could do this. I could put a single quote in front of everything here, but that seems like the long way to do it. Now, the textbook shows examples of using the quote operator with lists. That works with some dialects of Scheme, but not with our Kava dialect. When working with lists in Scheme, it helps to picture a list as a linked list. Now, technically, you don't need to know what the implementation of the list is. That's that whole separation of implementation and interface that we talk about in 163. But Using this mental model of a linked list will help you remember and understand why the scheme list functions behave the way they do. So let's look at some of those functions. First, as a linked list, there's really only two access operations. The car function returns the element at the head. And cutter returns the portion of the list that follows the head. In other words, this is the list that's pointed to by the head's next pointer. Some versions of Scheme add convenience access functions. For example, the textbook mentions functions like CADR, which is a shortcut for calling car on cutter, thereby returning the second element of a list. Kava doesn't provide these functions, but you can pretty easily write them for yourself if you find it convenient. If you're curious, the names car and cutter are historical artifacts. In the original implementation of Lisp on the IBM 704, car and cutter were the names of registers that stored the head and the next parts of the list node. 
Now remember, with a linked list, there's no way to directly access the nth element of the list. You have to walk n steps down the list and return the data at that node. So this is a good opportunity for you to write your first list function. Specifically, write a function named get that returns the value at index n on the list. And remember, Scheme doesn't have iterative loops, so you'll have to write it recursively. Also, for now, assume that there are at least n elements on the list, so you don't have to worry about error checking. All right, so let's look at one possible implementation. So remember, we're writing a recursive function. So when you're dealing with recursion, one of the first things you should be thinking about is your base case and your recursive case. So given that we're dealing with a linked list, what would our base case be? It would be the case where we just need the head of the list, where n is 0. So if n is 0, the element we're looking for is just the head of the list. Now what's the recursive step? So if you give me a list and ask for the fifth element, I can get you that same element by pulling the head off the list and asking you for the fourth element of what remains. So the recursive step here is to call get, but this time we want element n minus 1, and the list we're going to look at isn't the whole list, but the list without the head, which is what we get when we call critter. So that's all we need if we're not doing any error checking. So let's test it out quickly. So let's get the element at, let's say, index 3 on the list, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So if I run that, and I get D, which is correct. All right, so now add the error checking. So add some code so that if you, let's say, asked for element 10 on a list that only has eight elements, it will return hash F. It just stands for false. That's not necessarily a good general robust solution, but it's good enough for what we're doing here in the video. All right, so how would we do that? Specifically, how would we know if we've run off the end of the list? And so if I keep calling cutter again and again and again, eventually what I'll end up with is simply an empty list. And so we want to be able to test for the empty list. One way to do that is to use the function called null. So if I'm past a list that's null or empty, then I can't get the element at position n because there are no elements. So I'll just return that symbol for false. And if I don't have an empty list, then the rest of this works the way the previous implementation worked. All right, so let's see if that has the desired behavior. So this time let's ask for element seven. Okay, we get the false as expected. And just to make sure we're not off by one, let's also ask for element six. All right, so this is good. Now you'll notice here, this function's all written on one line. And that's not unusual for functional programming. You'll see this in Lisp, Scheme, and you'll also occasionally see long one-line functions like this in Ruby. And the question is, how readable is this? Now, to us, it's probably reasonably readable because we just wrote it. But when you're thinking about readability, remember, you're not thinking about you after you just wrote it. You're thinking about the poor new guy who walks in and is looking at this code for the first time. So if I want to bump up the readability of this, I'm going to put this on different lines. So I'm going to have an if, and then I have a condition, the true result, and then the false result. And then with this if, I'll do the same thing. I'll have the condition. I'll put the true result on one line. I'll put the false result on one line. And then I'll line up the closed parens. As you're learning scheme, spreading the code out like this may help you think through it a little better. The next thing you need to know is how to build up lists. And the two main functions for doing this are cons and append. Cons is short for construct. It constructs a list by combining a head and a tail. Append joins two lists together. Now pay special attention to this part. I found it unexpectedly difficult to correctly use cons and append when I first learned Scheme. As you'll see, the trick is just to have the correct picture in your mind of how cons and append manipulate the underlying linked lists. So let me say this again. When you're using the cons function, the construct function, you're putting a head and a tail together. The head is a single item. It is the data at the head. And then the tail is a list. So it should look something like this. 
Notice the first parameter is just a single element, a single symbol A, and the second parameter is a list. And when we put those together, we get a single list with A, B, and C in it. Now that first element can be a compound element. It doesn't have to be just A number, A symbol or whatnot, right? Let me show you. That first element can be even a list. But then what you get is the first element of the constructed list is a nested list. The list AB becomes the first element of the resulting list. So if you get a nested list where you don't expect it, go back, think carefully, and remember the first parameter to cons is the single item that's going to be in the head. If what you want to do is concatenate two lists, not construct a list head and tail, but just put two lists together, that's when you use append. So here I have two lists, and then I get those two lists appended. Now here's another common mistake, and that is to forget that the second parameter to cons has to be a list. So if I forget that, if I do this, right, I say construct and I give two single elements, then I get this, which in scheme is called a dotted pair. So what this is, is it means that there's a linked list structure, but the next isn't a pointer to a list, but is an actual data item. Now there are potential uses for this dotted pair scheme, but I don't anticipate using those in the course. If you see this dotted notation, unless you really know what you're doing, assume that you made a mistake like I just did here somewhere in your program. Similarly, append also expects its second parameter to be a list. So if you try to append a single element to a list, you're also going to get that dotted pair notation. What you're seeing here is an indication that the very last node in the linked list doesn't have a correct next pointer but has data in both the head and the next. So if what you really want to do is add a single element to the end of the list, you have to make that single element a list itself. Notice how I put C inside of a list. Or of course, you could just use the, the list operator as well. Remember, when I use the list operator here, then it's trying to interpret C as the name of a variable or a function. What I needed to do was put the single quote in there. Now, the textbook shows how to implement several other list functions, including is a member function and both a shallow and deep comparison, checking to see if two lists are equal. It also shows you how to implement append using only cons. So I encourage you to pause the video and look through these examples if you haven't yet. I'm happy to answer questions on them in class or in office hours, but I'm not going to step through them here in the video. But let's finish up with one more example, an example that's not in the book. What if you want to modify a list? Let's say you want to change the nth element. If we're writing in a pure functional programming style, we can't. We're not allowed to modify objects. That's one of the fundamental principles of the functional programming paradigm. All right, so what do you do when you need to modify a list? Well, you have to build a completely new list. You don't modify the existing list. You create a new list that contains the data you want on it, even if that means 99 out of 100 elements are the same. So try that out. Write a function named reset that puts a new value at index n on a given list. And again, remember what you're doing is you're constructing a new list that's identical to LST here, except when you get to element n, you're putting in value. All right, so how would we approach this? Again, this is a recursive function, so we want to be thinking in terms of base case and recursive case, and we're dealing with a linked list. Our base case is often the case where we can deal right with the head, so we'll take that same approach. So if it's the head we're talking about, what do we need to do? Well, we're going to build a new list, or in other words, we're going to construct a new list. At the head of the list will be the new value we want in the list, and the remainder of the new list is identical to the tail of LST, or in other words, the critter of the list. 
So if you stop and think for a minute, the new list and the old list are sharing the same tail, they just have different heads. Because the nodes in these lists are write only, they're not gonna change. So because we're using this functional programming paradigm, we don't have to worry about one list being changed when we don't want the other list changed. All right, now what about our recursive case? If it's not the first element that we want to change, then what's gonna be in this new list we're building? Well, the first element of the new list is going to be the same as the first element of the list we already have. And then we're going to recursively apply reset to the rest of the list. So the new value isn't changing, but we're stepping in recursively one step down the list. So the index we're looking for is decreasing by one. And the list we're applying this to is the tail of LST. Let's see if this works. How about we put Q as element four of the list A, B, C, D, E, F, G. All right, so element number four is the fifth element of this zero index list, and that's exactly what we got, A, B, C, D, Q, F, G. So our function worked as expected. Now I suspect for many of you, it's not completely clear why this works especially if it's been a while since you covered linked lists in your CS2 or data structures course. So we'll take some time in class to look at this again where I can draw lots of pictures on the whiteboard. In the meantime, it might help to take, let's say, five minutes and draw your own pictures and see if you can get your head around what's going on here. At the very least, having those initial attempts at pictures will give you something concrete to ask questions about if you're still confused. All right, so dig in. Try lots of examples, struggle with this a bit, and write down lots and lots of questions. That's, that's how I learned functional programming. It wasn't easy, it took a lot of practice, but we can take a few days in class if necessary. All right, see you then.